Before you skip today's video, just watch the top story. It's called Turn Around, watch it start to finish so you can see the ending, and then once you've seen the ending, watch it again. It is so creepy when you know what was actually going on the whole time they were there. But before we get into today's stories, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you've come to the right channel because that's all we do and we upload three, four, even five times every week. So if that's of interest to you, please offer to spot the like button on their next set of bench press, and then as soon as they start to fatigue, walk away. Also, please subscribe to this channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. All right, let's get into today's story. Stories. In the early 2000s, a teenager named Eben and his father would regularly go hunting in the Georgia backcountry. When Eben turned 14, his father befriended a very wealthy landowner in Georgia who offered them access to one of his best private hunting areas. And just a couple of days later, on October 5th, Eben and his father would take him up on the offer. They woke up super early and they drove out to the edge of this property that was actually fenced in. And they went to a main gate where they had the combo that this guy had given them. They punched in the combo, opened up the gate, drove in, shut the gate, locked it, and then continued down the access road. They followed this road for about two miles where it came to a stop right outside of this huge forest. They parked their truck, they got out, they put on their gear, and in the pre-morning darkness began hiking into the woods. Even though they were there primarily to hunt, Eben and his father secretly enjoyed just hiking around the woods and camping out, and any chance they got to extend their hunting trips, they would, even if the hunting wasn't good. And so since they spent a ton of time in the woods together, they noticed almost immediately when they walked into this particular forest that something was off. There's no birds, there's no animals, Silence. It's just totally silent. The only sounds they heard that were not them was a single plane that passed overhead. Although they found this very odd, they figured, you know what, this is private property, not a lot of people are out here. I'm sure as soon as we showed up, the animals were aware of us and they've scattered. They finally make it out to the hunting stand that the owner had told them about. They get all settled in, they're getting ready to see some animals and all day long, they don't see a single animal, they don't hear a single animal. In fact, again, it is just completely silent. Frustrated, they began packing up their stuff, making their way down off the stand, and they started looking for a place to make camp for the night, and Eben's father suggested, well, hey, you know, there's obviously nothing over here, it's been quiet all day, why don't we walk deeper into the woods a little ways, set up camp there, so tomorrow we have a better chance of seeing some animals. So they hiked for about an hour farther away from where they parked their truck, and they reached this clearing, which is perfect for setting up their camp, and so they set up their tent, and Eben's father says, hey, you know, we still got some daylight, do you want to go try our luck and see if we can see some animals out here now? Eben's like, yeah, why not? So they hike a little ways away from their campsite and they set up their blind and once again, they don't see any animals, it's totally quiet. And so they turn around and they start heading back. As soon as they could see their campsite, which really was just their tent, they noticed that their tent was now collapsed. And Eben's father turns to him and says, oh, it must have been the wind. And Eben says, no, it couldn't have been the wind because all day today we have been commenting on how quiet it is and how the fact that there's no weather, no wind, no anything is heightening the fact that it's completely silent. So it could not have been wind. So Eben's father is like, well, when you set the tent up, did you not put the posts into the eyelets? Did you not build it correctly? And Eben's like, no, I've made that tent like a thousand times. I know it was set up correctly. They walk into their campsite and they look down at their tent and they're really confused at what they see. The two rods that go in an X over the top of the tent that thread through nylon loops and then anchor at four different points on the base of the tent, well, they had been removed from the four corners. And if you know how a tent works, it works on tension. And once you have a rod anchored in two points, it doesn't just pop out. It's anchored at two sides. It's actually difficult to remove each anchor. Once one is out, the other comes out easily. But basically the rod would need to break in order for it to come out of those anchor points or someone would have to come over and remove it. And they didn't remove them and none of the rods were broken. Which leaves them with either they failed to set up their tent even though they had distinct and clear memories of setting it up and double checking it was set up because they put gear inside of it. Or 
someone came over to their campsite while they were gone and undid the four corners. They decide, you know what? It can't be some stranger coming over here because we're the only ones with the gate combo. This is private property and no one could have been here. And why would they do that if they came to our campsite? Why would they randomly collapse our tent and then vanish? So it had to be us. We must have not made the tent. And while they didn't really believe that they had not made their tent, they convinced themselves that that's what happened because the alternative was just too bizarre and frankly terrifying to consider. So they build their tent and they make a little fire and they stay up for a little while chatting before being tired and saying, okay, let's just go to bed. They extinguish the fire, they get in the tent and they both fall asleep. A couple hours later, Eben wakes up suddenly and he's not sure if he's dreaming or not, but he thinks he hears someone laughing a couple hundred meters behind their tent off in the woods. Eben instinctively turns to make sure his dad is still in the tent with him, and he is. And then Eben starts listening really intently to what's happening outside. And all he can hear is silence, like it's been since they got in the woods. He doesn't hear any more laughter. And so he says, okay, I must have just been dreaming and there wasn't any laughter out there. And eventually Eben goes back to sleep. A little while later, Eben wakes up suddenly again, except this time his dad is already awake and looking around anxiously. And Eben sits up and goes, what's going on? And his dad goes, shh. And he goes, can you hear that? And Eben listens and to his horror, he hears laughing. He wasn't dreaming before. Eben also realizes the laughter is not coming from the same area he heard it. It's now coming from the opposite direction and it's a lot closer to them. Eben very quietly and carefully explains to his dad that he actually heard this laughter a couple hours earlier. And Eben's father turns to Eben and says, before we came out here, I asked the owner, should we expect any other hunters or campers or anybody nearby? And the owner said, this is private property and it's fenced in. There is no one there but you guys. After this revelation, they both turn their attention back to just listening because they're hoping this is just gonna stop and whatever this is, is just gonna leave but it doesn't leave. They hear footsteps running towards them from way off in the forest. And it's so quiet, it's really easy to hear these footsteps. And whatever this is, is charging towards them. And then it comes to a complete stop right at the edge of their clearing. At this point, Eben is now grabbing onto his father. Eben's father is holding onto his rifle and he's getting ready to open the tent to confront whatever is out there. And right before he grabs the zipper, this thing, this person, whatever it is, starts laughing again. And it's practically right on top of them. It's so loud. They can hear it clear as day, right there, right outside their tent. And Eben's father takes a deep breath. He grabs the zipper and as soon as he begins moving it, the sound the zipper made causes the laughter to stop. They don't hear footsteps, so they know probably something's still out there. But the laughter stops like it's recognized that they're making noise. They're right there. There they are. They're in the tent. Eben's father freezes with his hand on the zipper and he's debating whether he should go outside or not. And before he can even make that decision, whatever this thing is, turns around and runs back into the woods and it's just gone. And for several minutes, they just sit like that in total silence, praying that whatever this is, is gone for good. And after several minutes, when they don't hear anything, there's no more laughing, there's no more running, Eben's father re-zips up the tent, puts his hand back down, and they're both left just sitting there thinking, what the heck just happened? Eben and his father would stay up all night and they would barely speak because whatever this thing was had heard them when they moved the zipper. And so they were really afraid of making any sound, even little sounds, because it's so quiet, sound travels really far and they don't know who or what is out there. And so in silence, holding their guns, they're just waiting for the sun to come up. And as soon as it did, they were up and out of there, literally running out of the forest, checking over their shoulder the whole time, all the way back to their truck. And so to this day, they have no idea who or what the heck was running around out there. And they told the owner of the property about it. And the owner just said, it's not possible. We have a totally gated in private piece of property and there are cameras watching the only entrance and you are the only ones that went in or out over that time period. And prior to that, we monitor this property. Nobody else was in there. In the summer of 2013, a young woman named Katie and her father decided to go camping at one of their favorite campgrounds in the Sierra Nevada mountain range. Katie loved going camping with her father because he was this totally accomplished outdoorsman and he used to be a wilderness guide for much of his life. And so she just always felt like she was in great hands whenever she was out in the wild with him. And she had kind of become a fairly accomplished outdoors woman herself. When they arrived at the campground, the parking lot was packed with cars. And they're like, shoot, I wish we'd called ahead a couple weeks ago and reserved a site because they're probably not even available now. 
but they went to the front desk and they were like, you're in luck, we have one available, but it's the one that's way over there. It was this one campsite that was kind of isolated from the rest of the campground. It was far away from the bathhouse, it was far away from where you go swimming, and it was far away from the parking lot. It was just like really inconvenient. And whenever they came camping here, it was like the one site they didn't want to use. But beggars can't be choosers. They were happy to even have a site. And so they drove all the way down, down this little road into this very isolated campsite, kind of in the middle of this forest. Once they got there, they began setting up their respective tents because they were not gonna be staying in the same tent. They each had these very small backpacking tents, which were so small that you could either zip it up all the way and stay warmer and more protected, but you had to sleep in a ball because your legs would not fit otherwise, or you could unzip the front of your tent and when you lay down, you could extend your legs fully, but your legs are protruding outside of your tent. So you could only do that in warmer weather and if you were comfortable having your legs poking out into the wilderness. After they set up their tents and they get their cooler set up and they have all their stuff kind of the way they want it, they go out hiking for the rest of the day. When they come back, they're totally exhausted, they fall asleep and nothing of note occurs over that first night. The next day they get up, they go back out, they go hiking all day all over again and they come back that night and they are totally exhausted again. And they get into their tents and they go to bed. And this night, something of note would happen. At about 3 a.m., Katie wakes up and she hears footsteps walking towards the campsite from a little ways off. They're in the woods somewhere. And she's thinking, okay, it's got to be my father because he's diabetic. And every night he gets up to go to the bathroom maybe three, four times. And he probably was just walking to the bathhouse and now he's walking back. But she realizes the bathhouse is over here, not over here. So what is he doing walking towards the campsite from this side? The footsteps come out of the tree line, they come into the clearing that is their campsite, and they stop about two, three meters outside of Katie's tent. Now there were no windows on Katie's backpack tent. There was just little vents at the front and the back that kind of pointed down. And so she couldn't see out anyways, and there was no illumination out, so you can't even pick up a silhouette. It's just total darkness out there. She can't see who's out there. She can only hear them. But she's thinking, okay, maybe my dad got lost coming back from the bathhouse because he didn't have a flashlight and he walked too far. That's possible. Or, you know, he could have decided to relieve himself just in the tree line, even though he's not known to do that. He's a guy that goes to the bathhouse. And so she's running through these scenarios that are convincing her that, oh, that's just my dad. But what she really wants to hear is that person walk away from her tent and get into her father's tent because that will confirm in her mind that that was her father. And so she's sitting here waiting for that confirmation and she hears the footsteps again, but instead of walking around her tent to her father's tent, this person walks right up against her tent very quickly. And they clearly begin leaning over her little tiny tent because she can hear them breathing right above her. And this is when she realizes, that's not my dad. And as she's having this terrible revelation that some stranger is outside her tent right now, she has an even worse revelation. It was a warm night that night, so she was sleeping with her tent unzipped and her legs poking out the end. She musters the courage to begin slowly retracting her legs back inside of her tent. But before she's able to do that, this person stands up, turns, and starts walking towards the base of her tent where her legs are. She's completely frozen and terrified about what's about to happen. But this person doesn't stop at her feet. They keep moving and in fact start circling her tent. But because they were making a lot of noise and walking around her, it allowed her to pull her legs back into her tent without you know, this person hearing her. And so she had the illusion of safety being inside of her tent, but her tent is still unzipped. So she's waiting for this person to come around and crouch down and look inside of her tent because it's open. And so she's just looking down there, hoping that doesn't happen. But unfortunately, right at this moment, the person walked to the base of her tent and came to a stop right outside where the opening to the tent is. And so she's sitting there thinking, please don't come in here, please don't come in here, please don't come in here. And even though her feet are pulled up into her tent, she suddenly feels something pinch her foot and she knows it's a hand, something has grabbed my foot. And she stifles a scream and she starts shaking uncontrollably because her instincts are telling her, don't let this person know you're awake. And luckily, as she's sitting there shaking from fear and trying to be quiet as best as she can, she's holding her mouth, this person stands back up again and goes back to the spot 
spot next to her tent and leans over the tent once again and she can hear them breathing right over her. And so for several minutes she lay there shaking with this random person who pinched her foot a minute ago hovering over her tent in the middle of the night and she has nothing she can do and she's just quiet she's hoping it's going to end soon and eventually this person would turn around and walk over to their cooler and their table and some other things that were out and she hears some rummaging going on some things are being moved around and then this person just kind of walks off into the distance but she doesn't know if they're gone she doesn't know if they're standing in the edge of the tree line waiting for her to come outside maybe they laid a trap for her and so she just lays there silent doesn't move and she's praying to herself please don't let anything happen to me or my father and all night she's just laying there and then eventually she does fall asleep probably hours go by but she does fall asleep because she wakes up again when she hears her father unzipping his tent and she charges out to meet him and she can tell right away that he's scared and before she can even say or begin to describe what's happened to her he says were you outside your tent last night at about two three in the morning because i heard all sorts of commotion near our cooler i wasn't sure if it was an animal i wasn't sure if it was you and she starts telling him no this is what happened to me and as she's describing what happened to her he looks behind her at the picnic table which was next to their cooler and they had their backpacks on it basically anything that didn't fit in their tents they kept near this picnic table and he points at it and she turns around and any item that was in the cooler or in their backpacks or that was just out has been stacked in a pyramid formation on this table. Clearly, the guy who was here last night did this for some reason they don't understand. And as they go over to look at it to see if anything's been taken, they notice this track of footprints, like these heavy footprints that have been going around and around Katie's tent. So she clearly wasn't imagining it. And so that instant, they packed everything up, got in their car, and they left. And to this day, they can barely talk about it with each other because it's all the things that could have happened. The father felt horribly guilty because he clearly heard this person but didn't leave his tent. And his daughter was clearly in danger. And his daughter's thinking, the tent was open. This person was crouched down, reaching into my tent, grabbing my feet. Like that's such a horrifying image. And so this has been completely traumatizing for them and they just don't talk about it anymore. From the 1950s until present, a Canadian family has owned this very isolated cabin in the middle of the Ontario backcountry. It was the only property on this very small lake. There was two others across the lake, but they were pretty far away. And with the exception of the side of the cabin that was facing the water, the rest of it was surrounded by really dense forest that went on for quite a while. About two miles away from this cabin on the other side of this dirt road was this huge wildlife reserve that was pretty much just a huge forest that was protected. And anytime the family was visiting this cabin, the kids would at some point go into the reserve and go explore. In 2001, when the family was at the cabin, the kids were across the road over at the reserve and they decided to walk down this particular trail that they hadn't seen before and they just started walking and for about 30 minutes they're seeing new areas they hadn't seen before and then they come to this clearing and there's all these abandoned houses at first there was a little debate about whether these were actually abandoned because they did look like they were in pretty good condition but when they walked a little bit closer it became very clear that nature is reclaiming this land grass is up to your waist you know there's vines growing up the side of the houses there were cars still parked in driveways that were totally rusted out and you know grass is growing all through them and so they knew these were abandoned they walked up to the first house they saw and they looked in and they couldn't believe what they were looking at it was like whoever lived here had left without taking anything the house was still totally furnished in fact their dining room table still had plates and cups and forks and knives like they had just had dinner and then just got up and left they start talking about going into these houses and looking around inside but they started wondering like is this a museum is that is that why everything is in such good repair you know should we not go inside these houses and they start looking around for any indication that definitely this is not a museum these are just plain abandoned and across the street from the house they were at was this totally decrepit looking house let's go over there and look in there and so they look in a window and very clearly the ceiling is totally sagging down and the first floor is buckling completely and there's clothes and shoes scattered everywhere and so for them this was confirmation that this is no museum 
These are abandoned. We can totally go look around inside. And so for the next couple of hours, the kids explored all the houses that looked structurally sound that weren't going to collapse on them. And it was just fascinating. There was all this stuff that was left behind that was fairly valuable. And they didn't take anything. They just thought it was very cool. And after a while, they decided they had seen enough and they turned around and headed back to their cabin. After they got back, they told their parents about what they found. And their father was like, man, that sounds awesome. I want to go check that out. And so that day, they went right back over to the abandoned houses. The first house they showed him was the really decrepit looking one where the ceiling was sagging and there was women's shoes and clothes all over the ground to show him for sure these are abandoned because we had some doubts at first too. These are definitely abandoned. So they look at that house and then they went back to the very first house they saw when they walked into this complex, the one that was in great condition and had the dining table still set. So they go inside and they go upstairs and they find this bedroom that like everything else in the house is totally intact. You got pictures on the wall, it's fully furnished. There's even still sheets made on the bed in the pillow. It's got a head imprint from whoever was there last. And at the foot of the bed is this beautiful fur coat. And the father walks over to it and he looks at it and he's like, this is real fur. This is a really expensive coat. I want to take this for our family. But before he took it, he had a hesitation. Is this really abandoned? You know, if someone had been here, they would have seen footprints all over the house just because there's grime all over the ground. And they can clearly see their footprints from where they've just come in. And he's like, no, this is just a weird situation. It's definitely abandoned. And finders keepers. And so he picks up the jacket and he says, I'm going to give this to mom after I clean it up. And so with the jacket in hand, the father and the kids explore the rest of the house. And when they go outside, they realize it's starting to get late and it's probably time to head back. And so they turn around and they start walking away from these houses towards their cabin. And they get about 50 or 60 meters away when one of the kids said he just had this weird sense that they were being watched. And so he turns around and he's shocked when he sees there is an old woman standing in the bedroom that they had just just been in where the fur coat was. She's got a loose bun on the top of her head. She's got this blue shawl on her shoulders over a cream blouse and she's glaring at them. When the kid saw this woman, he made an audible gasp and the rest of the group turned around too and saw this woman in the window. And the feeling was guilt. They're like, oh my goodness, we just stole from this poor woman who lives in this abandoned house. And so right away, the whole group starts walking right back towards the house. They're gonna give this jacket back. In fact, the dad is like, I'm so sorry. I shouldn't have taken this, I'm sorry. And as they're walking back towards the property, the woman in the window who hasn't said anything just turns around and walks back into the main part of the house. They can't see her anymore. And so as they're walking closer to the house, they're assuming she's going to come downstairs to retrieve this jacket that they've taken from her. And so they get right up to the front door and the father is yelling to her, I'm sorry, where do you want me to leave this jacket? I can bring it into you. And they're kind of just waiting for her to come downstairs and she doesn't. She's nowhere to be found. She's not making any sound. She's not indicating what to do. And so after waiting for a couple of minutes, the kids don't really know what to do and they're kind of getting uneasy about the situation. And the father is still very confident that he just wants to give this back and, and make amends, make peace with her, say he's sorry. And so he walks inside. He tells his kids, stay here. I'm going to go give it to her. And he goes inside and he disappears upstairs. And then all of a sudden from across the street in that decrepit house with the caved in ceiling, they hear one of the second floor windows come slamming down. And at the same time, their dad comes charging down the stairs, no jacket with him. And he's saying, go, go, go. And the kids are spooked from the window getting slammed and they start running away until they're about a hundred meters away from these houses. And they stop and they're panting and they're out of breath. And the kids ask their dad, what happened? And he says to them, I looked everywhere upstairs and I could not find that lady. I don't know where she is, either she's hiding from us or something, but I happened to be looking out at that other house. Something caught my eye, there was movement, and I saw another person in the second floor of that building that's falling apart. And I watched them slam the window, and then as soon as I did, I heard someone yell, get out, and I ran out after you guys. Now the kids and the dad are absolutely terrified and they want to leave, but they also want one more look at these buildings before they do. And when they had run away, they had stopped behind this big group of trees that obscured their view to the buildings. They were out of sight. And so they begin to peek their heads around the tree until they can see the building and they can't believe what they see. Standing in the window of the fur coat room is not only the old woman, but also a very tall man who's holding her shoulders and is bending down because his head is too high to look standing. He's crouched down and he's looking out the window next to her and they're both glaring towards them. 
The father and his kids are practically falling over themselves to sprint away and back to their cabin. To this day, that family has no idea who those people were, what they were doing there, how they were able to move around without making any noise and consistently hide from them and not leave any footprints. It was all very strange and terrifying stuff. And then the government ended up demolishing those houses almost immediately after they were there. And so they'll never get any answers because everything's gone. So that's gonna do it guys. Let me know in the comments what you thought of today's stories and I will pin the best comment at the top of the comments section. If you enjoyed today's stories and you haven't done this already, please offer to spot the like button for their next set of bench press. And then once they start to fatigue, just walk away. Also, please subscribe to this channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. If you want to get in touch with me, you can direct message me on Instagram or on Twitter. My username on both platforms is the same. It's just John Ballin 416 I also have a ton of content over on TikTok where my username is Mr. Ballin. If you have a story suggestion, please submit it to our subreddit just called Mr. Ballin. It's linked in the description below. So whether I see you on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, Reddit, YouTube, or some combination, just know that I really appreciate your support. And until next time, that's going to do it. See ya.